Hello folks and welcome back. This is a lecture on chapter 6 which is about a readability with style and design. And to get us warmed up to this topic, to get us in the zone so to speak, I posted a link uh, to one of my favorite Monty Python sketches uh, where John Cleese is up in front of a classroom as a professor giving some uh, allegedly simple instructions to the students. <laughs> of course it turns out to be anything but. I mean this is Monty Python we're dealing with. Uh, so go back and watch the clip if you haven't seen it already because uh, I want to ask uh, ask you starting out here what is it about that um, those instructions that make them so unreadable or unlistenable now what is it about the style and or the design of it uh, that makes it so incredibly confusing uh, so ponder on that uh, answer the question and then we'll move on And here we go with the learning objectives for this lesson. As you can see, there's only three. That might come as some <laughs> relief to you. Uh, but we're talking about the principles of writing style that improve ease of reading. So what can you do to make something more readable? Uh, well, completeness, conciseness, and natural processing are the three factors that we'll be focused on here. Uh, the other piece of this is the navigational design. Uh, so if we're talking about a website, this would be menus, interfaces, and so on. Uh, with the writing, though, it would be things like headings and bullets and uh, formatting, bold, underline, all that good stuff. Uh, well, then we'll wrap up by talking about the components of the reviewing stage, including that FAIR test, which if you remember uh, the FAIR, F-A-I-R, uh, uh, the F was the, the facts, A was accessibility, I was impact, and the R was respect. <laughs> we'll be administering that test, talking about proofreading strategies, and then feedback. So it's pretty good objectives uh, for this uh, presentation. We'll also be, oh, what do we have here? Oh, this is a chapter overview. Uh, so just telling you, we'll start by talking about the principles of the writing style, then get into navigation, and then reviewing. Okay, improving ease of uh, reading with completeness. And talk about these three basic strategies for this, providing all the relevant information, uh, being accurate with your information, and being specific. And all three of these are, are critical, and I see emails all the time <laughs> from students that'll uh, be missing one of these things. And I think I've talked about this before, but uh, one of the most common problems I get from student emails is they'll say, I need to, it'll be something like this, dear professor, I'll need to miss uh, your class on Wednesday, or I'll just, I haven't been able to complete an ass the assignment yet. Uh, can I get an extension? You know, something along those lines. But they won't include uh, what class it is they're talking about and what the assignment is they're talking about. Or they'll say something like, I got a zero on my assignment. Can you please look into that? Again, I don't know what class it is. <laughs> if they're emailing me from a different, uh, if it's not HuskyNet, uh, I might not even know who the person is. Uh, so they totally missed out on providing uh, that information. Uh, accuracy, of course, being another important thing. And I've seen this uh, coming at it from the other side sometimes. If, uh, you know, if I say on a syllabus, uh, this assignment needs to be four pages. But maybe uh, I'm talking about four double space pages or four single space pages. So that's not really being specific. If I don't specify that, that's an issue. Uh, and then the accuracy could be improved, I think, by saying, instead of just, say, one page, if I say 350 words, now that's a little more accurate and specific. Uh, so that'll help uh, reduce confusion that way. Uh, but it certainly would be inaccurate for me to have one thing on the syllabus and then another thing on the assignment instructions. You know, something along those lines would just totally confuse everybody, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's take them one by one. Uh, so providing all the relevant information and here we need to uh, think about the other person, put ourselves in their shoes, uh, behind their you know, screen, as it were. Uh, so we need to plan, write, review the message strategically. So repeatedly ask yourself, what information is necessary for the purpose of your message? Let me see if I read this. Did I read that right? Repeatedly asking yourself, what information is necessary for the purpose of your message will help you accomplish this. You know, I think this... Uh, uh, this author of this PowerPoint slide has kind of uh, not followed some of their own advice, which is not not unusual uh, for teachers. Uh, but I, if I were going to rephrase this, I would say, yeah, constantly ask yourself, what does this person need to know? Now, what am I trying to accomplish with this message? If it's uh, instructions for an assignment, 
you know, I need to say, what would the, you know, looking at it from the student's point of view, what are they going to want to know? Well, probably how long does it need to be? Uh, how many words is usually the, one of the key things. Uh, how much time do they have to work on it? Uh, how many sources needs, need to be included? Uh, what type of research they'll need to do? Uh, all that sort of stuff uh, falls under this bracket. And if you really want to write a great assignment, you need to factor in all of this, all this information. Now, unfortunately, a lot of teachers like to include a lot of irrelevant information. Yeah, it might be really interesting to them. They're excited. They're passionate about it. But uh, they put so much stuff on that assignment sheet that is redundant or is not really necessary for the, just you know coming at it from the student's point of view that uh, the student might just say well, you know a lot of this is irrelevant I'm just going to skip skip around start skimming and scanning see if I can get to the what's really important here and inadvertently miss uh, the the key stuff uh, so all that all that is true of being a good teacher coming up with good assignment instructions but also of course for you in the business scenario uh, in a business email, whatever the document is, you always want to be thinking strategically. Uh, accuracy, another key uh, part of this, obviously. Uh, they talked about being specific about uh, your facts or your, uh, you know, the generalities like this. This plan will save you money. Uh, well, how much money? Uh, how will it do that? You know, that's the sort of zone we want to be in. Uh, in this lecture, thinking about those kind of issues. Uh, but if you do have, if you're accurate and you're specific, you will have more impact on the reader's perceptions. You know, they'll take you a lot more, they'll think you're a lot more credible. You know, unfortunately, I've had, uh, I've heard of some colleagues and some professors I had uh, who they don't like to be uh, too specific with their assignments. And, and what they're thinking is they don't want to tie you down. You know, they want you to be free to experiment, to innovate, to uh, be creative and take some initiative and so on and so forth but <laughs> often could come across as just being uh making it seem like the, even the professor doesn't really know what they want uh, that's how the students can can read it sometimes they, they get that perception uh, whereas if somebody comes in and they says and they say something like look i want a five paragraph essay of you know a thousand words and it needs to have uh, three sources you know if, they, if they're if they if they're that level of if they have that level of specificity and accuracy, it makes it seem like, well, at least I, I'm pretty sure that this professor has a very good idea of what, what they're looking for. And maybe the student objects, could object and say, well, you know, I feel like I'm being restrained uh, with all these requirements. You know, I'd much rather be free to find my own way. <laughs> so, so you can kind of clash like that. But uh, just me as a student, I prefer to uh, somebody that would just tell me what, <laughs> what they want. <laughs> uh, yeah, just one inaccurate statement can lead readers to dismiss your entire message and lower the trust in your future communications as well. Uh, so, yeah, this will happen sometimes in the classroom. Uh, this student will ask you, how many pages does that need to be? And maybe you know, maybe you think you remember it being three. You're not really sure. You just say three, then you find out, oh, it's actually supposed to be five. <laughs> so you just said something inaccurate. Uh, now suddenly they're starting to question everything uh, that you do. Or if you, you know, you say they were supposed to read this and then you come to class and you forgot and you're saying that you got the wrong reading assignment. <laughs> you know, this is all stuff that's happened to me to, to yours truly before. And I can tell you, it definitely does impact the, uh, the credibility. So it really is important to be accurate in your communications. I find it's always better, even if it Temporarily, you lose a little credibility by saying, look, I don't rem remember that. Uh, let me look it up. Take a couple minutes, look at that, <laughs> come back. Because it's better to be, uh, just to admit you forgot something, you need to look it up, than to say something inaccurate. You know, I, I think that's a pretty fair thing to say. Now, let's look at some examples here uh, from the world of business. Uh, so they're saying this is less effective. Uh, your store should spend roughly 30% of annual sales on local advertising and so what happened there it's a, it's a typo uh, they said 30 percent they really meant three percent uh, so this is just classic example you slip that extra zero in there maybe you weren't double checking your numbers <laughs> you got the, got this mistake on the file and of course this will be hard to re recover from uh, there's a, a whole there's an arc on the show Better Call Saul about this exact sort of thing. I think it's a date or an address. One number gets transposed and it basically costs this whole, uh, uh, costs this guy's uh, career in the law. 
Uh, so that's just kind of a pop culture example of that. But you know, it happens all the time. You just really want to be careful with, especially with some numbers, you know, make sure you didn't slip a zero in there, <laughs> a six instead of a three. You know, just, just be aware, no matter how long you've been doing this kind of thing, uh, these errors can creep in. Uh, yeah, of course, it'd be more effective to actually have the correct figure. You know, it's, it's amazing how actually having a correct, <laughs> correct information <laughs> is better than the incorrect information. Well, let's see what we have here. It's a big, looks like a big block. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I have to wade through this. <laughs> uh, so they got a bunch of information, a bunch of numbers, big sums of money uh, all throughout this thing. Let's see what happened. Incorrect calculation leads to one of the figures being off by $100,000. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a pretty serious problem. Uh, $100,000, that'd be uh, pretty bad to, to mess that up. Yeah, so just making sure you have the correct figures. And this is one of the things that just as a, again, coming back to my experience as a teacher, it's a lot better if you have, so if you're going to be using something like Connect or um, uh, Edpuzzle, you know, one of the problems I run into is that I'll have to transpose the scores from the Edpuzzle gradebook into D2L. And uh, the same thing with the Connect. It'd be a lot better if they would just, if I could automatically set it up so that the scores would just go in uh, so they kind of takes out this what they call a human error and so every time i have to go in and do something manually like that there's always a chance uh, that i might give somebody a 60 instead of the 90. you know it just happens accidents like that happen that's why it's better not to have the opportunity for that to happen uh, but since i have to do that always at least try to double check at least uh, to make sure i got these uh, scores in because uh, again it really could in fact uh, impact uh, my credibility if I'm always putting in the, the wrong score really you could you don't have to use your imagination <laughs> to see how that would reduce my uh, credibility uh, so always worth double checking this stuff especially numbers yes and this is my favorite one of these uh, being specific the more specific you are the more likely your readers are to have their questions answered because you can't always count on people a lot of people, they're, they're too shy, they're too nervous, whatever it is, they won't ask you their question. Uh, they'll just think it, it's something they should know, they won't ask, and then they'll get it wrong, and then ultimately the responsibility for that will come back on to you. Uh, so better to you know, give somebody too much information than uh, not enough. Uh, if you're not specific, your readers may become impatient and begin scanning and skimming for the information they want. And uh, you know, this is the, I just gave the example a while ago of these, uh, a lot of teachers, especially student teachers that I went, you know, the teachers I went to school with, <laughs> uh, that they would be writing assignments and maybe they're writing this prompt for an essay and they've gone on for like three pages about, you know, everything you could possibly, it's like a mini miniature book. <laughs> Instead of, it's like they've almost written an essay themselves about the essay you're supposed to be writing. Uh, so they might think they're so clever and they, they spent so much time on this document, you know, and all this. They're so proud of it, right? And the student's going to be <laughs> delighted <laughs> to read this. <laughs> you know, they just want like a little bulleted list maybe. Uh, because, again, sometimes less is more with this. If they want to know, uh, wh when is this due? Or how many words does it need to be? You know, you don't want this buried somewhere down in the you know, third paragraph, fourth line, because <laughs> uh, then they'll miss out on all the uh, important information. So you're really much better, I think, to follow the journalistic model, uh, which is to give all the important information up front. And then maybe if you want to have more stuff, you just put a section on there like <laughs> miscellaneous <laughs> or additional info, you know, info for really nerdy students, you know, <laughs> kind of being a little facetious there, but you get the idea. And you could put all that at the bottom somewhere. Well, I like to do uh, additional suggestions or help, and uh, just make sure you got the top uh, information there. Uh, other ways this applies is with, say, a resume. That's something I always hammer on when students are writing resumes: is you don't want to just be stating general things like "I improved the sales at my company" or "I help students get better grades." Uh, you wouldn't want to put something like that in the letter or the resume. Uh, you want to be more specific than that. You know, so how much money are we talking about? Um, did you just say you had good grades or did you give a specific GPA? Uh, did you 
if you tutored people did they do you know what kind of grades they ended up with you know did five of them did you tutor five people and they <laughs> went from c's to a's <laughs> you know that's being a specific if you just say you worked with people to improve scores again not really very specific now let's look at the examples uh, from the book uh less effective uh, once approved new sunrise stores can be opened quickly you know, we got this adverb uh, quickly uh, what is quickly <laughs> what do you mean quickly within two years is that considered quick five is it a couple of days uh, maybe they think this is uh, the next day it probably wouldn't be right uh, the phrase between three and 12 months is specific and avoids ambiguity so again we instead of just saying quickly you say between three and 12 months much much better uh, the minimum store size is based on location Oh, this is the less effective one. Uh, the, minimum, the minimum minimum store size is based on location. Typically, the minimum size is larger in strip shopping centers than in shopping malls. Uh, so the term larger there is not very specific. They want you to actually spell out uh, the square feet. So 2,500 square feet and 3,400 square feet, as opposed to just saying larger. <laughs> uh, so you could see how this would really uh, make a difference. You know, if you're somebody that Maybe every square foot is valuable to you. Uh, even one or two square feet might make a difference in some cases. Uh, so being specific there is a, a much better strategy. Improving the ease of reading with conciseness. Uh, so this is the classic. There's a really great style book out there. It kind of gets um, it kind of gets maligned these days. And remember, I was just finished grading your uh, previous uh, Ed puzzles, and they were. And there we were talking about the, the classic five paragraph essay and i'm probably one of the few people here i feel like <laughs> uh, that actually likes that and approves of the five paragraph essay model uh, usually most people want to poo poo on that and say that's a, that's a terrible uh you know thing to be teaching you, sh you shouldn't be teaching five paragraph essays and grammar and mechanics and you know that's like basic stuff the students already know all that or it's not important or it's boring i, I don't know they got lots of different <laughs> reasons not to teach it uh but anyway i i guess i'm the iconoclast you know i, I still value that stuff uh, but another one is the idea of omitting needless words and this uh, brings me to this book i'm talking about there, there's a book i think you should read uh, you probably want to hear a lot of people in English uh, recommending it to you, but it's it's called The Elements of Style. And it's by uh, Strunk and White. And the Strunk is kind of the classic of curmudgeonly uh, English teacher. But White is the author of uh, E.B. White. He's the author of Charlotte's Web, a bunch of uh, other you know great works of fiction. So they're very talented writers. He kind of bring, he kind of makes a, hu a little bit more human uh, attaches to this book. But anyway, I bring it up because that was the big theme of that book is omit needless words uh, be concise uh, less is more you know all this kind of stuff comes back to the same idea uh, so maybe in a novel creative writing class something like this it's, it's very important to have this voice you know we talk a lot about uh, the author's voice coming through powerful uh, you know resonating with the audience you kind of like it's almost like hearing a good speaker talk you don't necessarily want them to be uh a brief <laughs> it's kind of the, kind of the point is you want to hear them for as long as possible you want to savor uh, the moment uh, whereas in business writing this is seldom seldom the case uh, people just want you to get to the point uh, say it quickly uh, say it clearly and then move on because I got better things to do with my day <laughs> spend all spend all day with your report all right so same idea here and often think about this is the difference between uh, going to a massage therapist uh, versus going to a surgeon uh, you probably don't want that massage therapist to be concise you, you know you kind of want that to last a while uh, whereas the surgeon uh, you really don't want to have it's not any benefit to you for that surgery to go over and you know the extra half hour <laughs> the extra extra 10 minutes sometimes you know every minute that your body is open uh, is just waiting it's just inviting infection inviting sepsis um, that sort of thing you really want that surgeon to get in there uh, get the job done <laughs> close everything up and get out of there and so when I'm thinking it's kind of a morbid example maybe but I'm just saying uh, in a business writing scenario think of yourself more like that surgeon uh, than that uh, massage therapist 
Uh, improving ease of reading uh, with conciseness. Yeah, so now we're getting into the, the nitty gritty here. Uh, controlling the paragraph length, huge thing. Uh, it's really easy to jump into sentences and start looking for words, and you know that's a long word. Maybe you could use a shorter word, uh, that sort of thing. It's a little bit higher level though. Uh, to start looking at paragraphs, and a lot of students struggle with this. Again, they're used to thinking about sentence level stuff. But if you can make that leap up a notch and go up a level to the paragraphs, uh, that's going to be really helpful, and, and we'll get into that. Uh, using the short sentences in most cases, you know, you're not writing the Declaration of Independence here. We're not, <laughs> we're not Madison. <laughs> uh, we're not um, Thomas Jefferson. You know, style has evolved uh, since those since the uh, 18th century. You know, nowadays we like uh, shorter sentences, more active sentences. Uh, we'll show you some of those. Uh, avoiding redundancy. Again, nothing worse than just uh, all this extra. All the verbosity <laughs> it doesn't need to be there. <laughs> Why are you repeating yourself? You know, I always uh, tell students, I always chuckle when I'm reading, reading a student essay, and somewhere there they put, you know, as I've said repeatedly, <laughs> or as I was saying in previous whatever, I think, so you're admitting that you're just repeating yourself at this point. I mean, <laughs> don't you think that, it, you know, if you catch yourself writing something like, as I've said, or as I've Say, as I've said above, or as, I, as I'm repeating, <laughs> if you get yourself tempted to, to write that, that is a, a warning sign. It's like a go back, edit, you are being redundant. You need to edit some stuff, move some stuff around uh, to avoid that redundancy. Okay, let's see what else. Avoid empty phrases. Yeah, so a lot of times when we're speaking, we need a little time to think about what it is we want to say. So we use some phrases, you know, in order to... <laughs> <laughs> There's all kinds of them, uh, starting sentences with there is or, or there are. Uh, any of that stuff gives you a little time to think. And we do the same thing when we're, when we're drafting. You know, you're writing out stuff. You're kind of having thoughts as you, as you go along. Uh, that's fine. That's perfectly normal. But the goal is to go back later, clip those, you know, clip out those empty phrases, be more concise. And let's see what the last one is. Avoiding uh, the prepositional phrases. Again, in, in order to uh, all that sort of stuff. Okay, controlling the paragraph length. So how long should a paragraph be? This is a classic question, and they'll, you're never going to get a hard fixed rule for this because a lot of it is based on the situation. You know, every paragraph has a different purpose, right? Uh, but just in the ballpark of uh, 40 to 80 words in a business document, is about right. Uh, for routine messages, paragraphs as short as 20 to 30 words are common, you know, inappropriate. So we're talking about maybe just one sentence, one or two sentences, up to about maybe three to five sentences. And why is this? Well, long paragraphs can signal disorganization, and even worse than that would be disrespect for the reader's time. Uh, so you could imagine how annoyed you'd be if I gave you an assignment uh, due next week and it was just one massive paragraph that went on for like a page and a half <laughs> you know i just i'm just even looking at these lines here i'm getting bored and confused and feeling <laughs> disrespected <laughs> it's like do i uh, come on i don't want to have to read all that uh, just to figure out what it is i need to do for you know crying out loud you know this is this is a mess you know, it'd be much better to have this you know consolidated you know, look at that. You know, and again, I'm just literally just drawing lines across a page, but somehow this this somehow feels uh, better to me than this you know big tangled mess there. Uh, so definitely keep this in mind. How long you want those paragraphs to be? It doesn't cost anything to hit enter and tab. Oh my God! <laughs> oh my goodness! Look at that! Look at this mess! I mean, I'm not even going to, I'm not going to read this. My God, look at that. I, I don't even know how many words, that's got to be, it looks like about 300 words just in one big, big blob. You know, look, imagine trying to dig through that to find the information you need. Just a big mess, and it makes it even worse, and you've got a lot of uh, numbers in there, <laughs> numerical figures. <laughs> Talk about being a... You know, we just got finished talking about concision, right? And they're saying numerical figures. 
instead of just numbers. But anyway, uh, you can see what's going on here. Just nobody's going to read this. It's just a big old mess. Now let's take a look at the cleaned up one. Yeah, look at this. Much more effective. So now we've got the two paragraphs instead of the, the big one. Uh, we've got some information consolidated here into two separate paragraphs too. It's not like they just broke it in half, uh, but they actually uh, uh, organized it better. So edited for conciseness, divided, uh, one paragraph of 80 words. So there's your 80 word one. Then the other one's about half that length at 44. Uh, so again, it's not important that every paragraph be the exact same size. That doesn't matter. Uh, it's just more important not to let any one of them uh, go on for too long and end up with that big uh, mess. Use the short sentences in most cases. So short sentences uh, allow the readers to comprehend your ideas more easily. <laughs> kind of a no-brainer there. You know, the if you think about just what, what's happening in your brain as you're trying to parse a sentence, you're sort of clutching at words, you're kind of holding them in your working memory as you get on to the end of the sentence. And by the time you get to more easily, if it's a short sentence, you won't have any problem, right? That's, that's there, boom. If it's a long sentence, though, you might, by the time you get here, you got to go back, uh, look up and see what the subject was again. It creates a lot of confusion. And if you look at the, uh, the, cogn the uh, cognitive psychology behind some of this stuff, it's really interesting. Uh, they have what they call a phonetic loop, or I think that's right. Uh, but they basically talk about a cassette tape. So if you imagine if your brain was a tape, <laughs> except the tape is only uh, two seconds long. Uh, so this is recording like two seconds uh, worth of sound or words. And they're saying as you read something silently, you're really hearing it uh, subconsciously in your, in your head, but only about two seconds. And so you can remember about two seconds of the sound. And so if it would take you longer than that to read a sentence, uh, then already uh, you're kind of putting strain on the tape. It means you're basically going to have to go back in and, and look at the earlier parts. Uh, so you could, I don't know if we could time this somehow, but um, even looking here at this example, short sentences allow your readers to comprehend your ideas more easily. So I'm pretty sure that was more than two seconds long. <laughs> I don't know, you could time yourself to see. Uh, what you think about this but but I like this idea you know it seems to be to hold up pretty well scientifically uh, so the shorter the sentences the better in most cases as uh, so we have some examples here of uh, long ones uh, so here's the less effective one our brand is strongly recognized among our customers and is associated with positive characteristics such as quality and reliability, and our customers associate these qualities with the special occasions in their lives. So that was only 32 words. Uh, definitely, uh, I felt tired <laughs> reading that. <laughs> I kind of lost track of it pretty quickly, what they were trying to say in that. Uh, let's look at the more effective one. To our customers, our brand represents quality products that help them celebrate special occasions. Yeah, so definitely. I don't know about you, but I can definitely hold on to that second sentence better. It seems to stick better. I don't have to go back and look at the first part again. Uh, I'm able to hold that in working memory. And there's a couple other examples there, but I'm sure you get the idea. Uh, let's see. Comprehension rate and sentence length. Uh, so try to keep sentences under 20 words. I guess the, just the breakdown of the average words per sentence. Um, uh, there's a sidebar in the textbook that talks about uh, the statistics you can generate with Microsoft Word. Uh, so most people don't know about that feature. Uh, and it's a little bit different depending on what version of Word you're using. So you probably just want to look it up online or go to help and go to the help options within Word to find it. Uh, but it will give you the information like how many, what's your average words per sentence. And it's really helpful to look at that sometimes just to get a comp quick computation. And you can see, well, are you, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't be over here. You might be uh, averaging like 30 words per sentence. Uh, so in that case, you'd want to go in there and see if you could uh, do some pruning, uh, break some of them up into uh, multiple sentences. Here's some redundancy issues. And redundancy basically just means uh, unnecessary information. Are you repeating yourself? Let's look at the example. Less effective. Uh, to help you reach your goals, 
we provide you with the products and resources to succeed. Uh, so they have it italicized here, the redundancy. So we don't need to say to help you reach your goals and to succeed because they're basically the same thing. So you could just say, we provide you with the products and resources to succeed. That removes 10 words uh, from the document. And this is, is really uh, one of the main things I do when I'm editing uh, resumes and cover letters and things of that sort, is just reduce uh, redundancy. Because usually what I find, I have a student that says something like, you know, can I, is it okay for me to use two pages? Because I really can't say everything I need to say in one page. But then when you look at the document, you see so many examples like this, just re repeated information, uh, being really wordy. And usually I could just, even in just a few seconds, go through there and eliminate all that stuff and, and get back down to a page. And so it's really useful. And a lot of, even the novelists, I like to read books by novelists and story, you know, short story authors where they talk about the craft of writing. And I forget who says it, but you know, I, I've actually seen something similar in multiple uh, stories or accounts like that. They'll say, now, one of the main things to do in the editing phase is to cut everything by a third. You know, some even say by a half. You know, so if you have a short story of uh, five or I guess three pages, you know, think about, can you get it down to two pages? <laughs> <laughs> it's making that and that amount of cutting uh, is helpful sometimes really you know it increases the speed of the story uh, ratchets up the tension you know everything else is, is great and you know, of course you don't want to be cutting the stuff that's important uh, but if you can find stuff that really doesn't add that much uh, maybe you thought it was a good idea at the time but now you're looking back on it you're saying you know that's not really even needed there I can cut that I can cut this uh, usually that makes for a better document yeah, and here's some of those empty phrases we were talking about. Uh, needless to say, well, if it's needless to say, then why are you saying it? <laughs> anyway, uh, needless to say, the profit, profitability of a store depends on many factors. So that's a whopping 12 words. Can we get it down? Yeah, the profitability, profitability of a store depends on many factors. So we just cut out the uh, needless to say. Let's see, what do we have here? Uh, with all due respect, uh, Sunrise suggests other locations for your store based on our marketing formula. Uh, so we don't need to say with, with all due respect. You know, some of the, my favorite ones is when somebody says, uh, let's say something like, uh, well, well, I, in all honesty, or honestly, comma, you kind of wonder, well, so does that mean that everything else you said has been dishonest? Uh, or another one is the personal, or in my personal belief, uh, blah, blah, blah. So I always say, well, if it's personal, then why are you putting it into an essay? <laughs> Shouldn't personal information be kept personal? Uh, but anyway, those are kind of silly examples, but uh, I'm sure you get the idea. People are always using these. They, they hear these uh, phrases and they think it makes them uh, sound more official somehow. And so they'll just load up the document with this stuff. And really all it does is just clutter things up and reduce concision. All right, so to be honest, <laughs> let's talk about, I'm talking about avoiding wordy prepositional uh, phrases. So let's see, do you know what a prepositional uh, phrase is? Let's see, are there any here? We have uh, as efficiently as possible. And so obviously the goal is not to avoid them entirely. Uh, we just want to keep from stringing, stringing too many together. And you probably picked up on the fact that uh, that Monty Python clip I showed you, this was really the problem. It was just too many prepositional phrases uh, tacked on one after the other. And then some of them referred to uh, the other ones. It was basically a recursive set of prepositional phrases, which is really the worst. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you'll find you can reduce word count by 30 to 40 percent simply by converting many of those uh, prepositional phrases into single word verbs. So what does that mean? Can we get some examples. Oh, yes, we can get some examples. Uh, so let's look at this. Uh, this is the less effective sentence. It will have uh, un uh, unnecessary prepositional phrases. So let's see where they are. I'll just read the sentence to you. In an effort to maximize your profitability as a Sunrise owner, you should be in attendance at each annual retreat. So that's 20 words. And so when we cut out those uh, prepositional phrases, we get attending the annual sunrise retreats helps you maximize profitability. And so we go from 
in attendance at each retreat, <laughs> just down to attending, <laughs> uh, in an effort to maximize your profitability as Sunrise owner, uh, all that just becomes maximize profitability. So you notice what we've done, remove some of these uh, uh, infin uh, infinitives, be more direct with our uh, verbiage. I kind of like this, so let's look at one more. Let's look at the second example here. Uh, this is the ineffective example. In the business planning process, please keep in mind that at Sunrise, we are here for you. We are here for you. In the business planning process, please keep in mind that at Sunrise, we are here for you. Just kind of emphasizing those uh, prepositional phrases there. 17 words is what that weighs in at. Let's look at the more effective one. We only, they basically cut seven words from it. Please remember that we will help you with business planning. So I'll just read them back to back. So don't look at it, just listen. So example A. In the business planning process, please keep in mind that at sunrise, we are here for you. Here's the second one. Please remember that we will help you with business planning. So I think that's pretty clear. Uh, which one of those is clear? <laughs> Okay, let's look at some more uh, tips here. Uh, use the action verbs when possible, right? The, I kind of think about this as showing, not telling. You know, people want action. <laughs> action, action, more action. This is America. We are all about action. Uh, use active voice. Kind of goes along with uh, this first one. Uh, you want to avoid passive. We'll, we'll get into some examples where the passive voice is, uh, is okay. Uh, use short and familiar words and phrases, right? Just put down the thesaurus. <laughs> Quit using juxtaposition every other word. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, just keep it simple. Uh, use the parallel language. This is probably the key. One of my favorite things. You can really take a document just because it's a business document. And it doesn't, need, doesn't mean it needs to be ugly and awkward. Uh, you can really use parallel language to... I really do think about this as kind of beautifying uh, a document. If you have really nice parallel structure, it just looks really nice. It's kind of like building a nice, uh, a nice shed. <laughs> you know, you got everything's level, uh, everything's lined up. It's every the window looks good. The, you know, everything is nice and parallel. You don't have one side being longer than the other side, uh, one corner sticking out. It's, it's that kind of thing, uh, but applied to uh, essays. Uh, avoiding the buzzwords and the figures of sp uh, speech. Yes, if you want to solutionize and operationalize your document, <laughs> it's a good idea to, uh, to follow this. And it's kind of, you know, I'll just say it's, it's a little bit bogus because there is another side to this, which is that the buzzwords uh, make you sound like you fit in. You know, you're kind of talking the talk. You're, you're talking the, uh, the lingo uh, of the other uh, folks there. So, but, you know, people from outside business look at it and they say, that's nothing but business ease. Uh, that's just business jargon uh, you're throwing around there, and, you know, and sometimes it is. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's not like there's this pure English uh, that's always clear that everybody understands either. Uh, so I always just say, don't. I think it's a little too much to say avoid it entirely. Uh, just be aware of it. Don't overdo it, and definitely don't do it to, to cover up uh, and not having the information or in a deceitful way. And then uh, avoiding it is, and there are, yeah, again, usually a good idea not to start off every sentence with it is, blah, 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 or, or there are several reasons why. Instead of just saying there are several reasons, you could just say um, several reasons are. Uh, you can usually just cut out this. And again, this is something that usually comes up when you're talking, but when you're writing, you have the chance to go back in and revise it. And so that's why it's kind of a... All right, so let's talk about this, this action verb business. Uh, so they, they say, first find nouns you can convert to action verbs. Uh, so example, if we had uh, have a meeting, uh, you could just say meet. So instead of saying, let's have a meeting tomorrow at noon, you could just say, let's meet tomorrow at noon. And cut some words that way, it's a little more active. Uh, same thing with the uh, perform an investigation. You could just say, we, we will investigate. Uh, you get the idea. And, and I don't think it's correct to say you should always do this. Uh, just do that sometimes uh, to cut back a little bit. Uh, again, it's not like you have to be some kind of robotic, super concise machine. Uh, we just want to see what we can do to reduce uh, the redundancies, to, to remove it about a third, 
is a pretty good number to shoot for. Let's see, secondly, find verbs of the form to be, uh, such as is, are, and am, and convert them into action verbs. So uh, the example there might be, sunrise is a great place to open a franchise. So there we're using that verb is. Uh, we could write, sunrise provides great opportunities for franchises. So you can compare those two. So we just get rid of the is, stick an action verb in there, provides instead, and it works good. Let's look at some other examples. Uh, we have made an estimate that you will need an initial investment of between 29,000 and 65,000. Uh, so one of the things I look for uh, when doing this kind of editing is if you're using lots of uh, words that end in like mint or eights, Usually that's a sign that you've uh, used a lot of uh, what you call a nominalization. You take a, a, a verb like invest and turn it into a noun by putting mint on the end of it. It's called a nominalization. Sometimes it's absolutely fine. Nobody's going to care. It looks great. Uh, but if you get carried away with it, it just makes it needlessly long and, and confusing. And so instead of saying we have made an estimate, we just say we estimate. Instead of saying uh, you will need an additional investment, that we just change that to you will initially invest. So invest instead of investment, uh, you get the idea. Uh, Sunrise is a company with excellent customer service. We just change that is a company, blah, 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 with provides, make a little more active, and we're done. Okay, <clears throat> active voice versus passive voice. This is something that just endlessly confuses the, the hell out of a, a lot of students. I'm sure if you're teaching, um, L191 of working in the right place. Uh, you know, this can be very difficult to get across. Like, what does this mean, active voice, passive voice? It's just completely baffling. And it, to be honest, it took me a long time to figure out what, what the heck it is as well. It kind of helps to look at this breakdown, this, this sort of formula, uh, the doer as the subject. So the grammatical subject of the sentence is what is doing the verb. And the object there is just what is it doing it on. In the passive, we just kind of flip this around. You put the object in the subject position, and uh, it may or may not be what's doing on the verb. And so you can see it's already kind of confusing. It's a lot better to look at the examples, I think, than to try to study this formula. Uh, so let's look at the active voice here. Sunrise provides free training for up to three people for each new store. So the key question is, what is the verb? Say, well, the verb is uh, provides. And you say, who is doing the providing? Or what is doing the providing? And you say, it's, it's sunrise. So is sunrise the subject of the sentence? Yes, it is. <laughs> so that is active. <laughs> uh, whereas passive, look, let's look at this one. Free training is provided for up to three people for each new store. So what's the verb there is is. is. This is one of the B verbs, right? And then you say, what is the doing the, the providing there. What, what is providing something? Well, it's not really said in the sentence, right? Uh, sunrise is providing the free training, but it's not mentioned. Uh, this is a passive construction. Again, doesn't mean there's nothing wrong, like this is grammatically incorrect. It's just when we look at the subject of the sentence, free training, uh, that's not what is, you know, the free training is not providing itself. Uh, somebody else is providing it. So it's the object, but it's in the subject part of the sentence. And so that's kind of the, <laughs> it's about as good as I can do to uh, describe this. You know, the example I usually give is, you know, the, uh, the boy kicked the ball uh, versus the ball was kicked. Or the, the little kid uh, doesn't say, <laughs> I, I broke the cookie jar, mom. <laughs> you know, the kid will say, the cookie jar broke. You know, they don't want to say, I broke it. Uh, they don't want to use active there because that's say, hey, you know, it's it's time for me to go stand in the corner. <laughs> say passive, you know, I don't know, that cookie jar broke. Maybe the wind knocked it over. I don't know. <laughs> All right, here's some more active uh, voice um, information. So the doer active option object, <laughs> let me try that again. Uh, the doer action object structure allows for faster processing because most people's natural thinking occurs in this way. So here we're getting into the uh, neuro-linguistics of all this, the natural language processing. You know, How does our brain actually interpret what these sounds you're hearing? Uh, how do you make sense of any of this? We're taking it to that level. And they, they've done some studies and found this structure. It's that simple sentence. 
Uh, the boy kicked the ball. The boy kicked the ball. That structure works. <laughs> it's, it's the fastest one. <laughs> Emphasizes the business orientation of action. Most importantly, it specifies the doer. And so we have the boy there. If I just say the ball was kicked or the jar broke, or the jar was broken, uh, we don't really know who did it, right? We're not specifying that. And usually in a business, if we're trying to be transparent anyway, uh, you don't want to do that. Let's look at some uh, less effective examples here. A marketing plan, a budgeting, a marketing plan, budgeting plan, and break-even analysis will be provided to you with your active participation. Uh, so you see there, uh, we're not emphasizing the person provide or the company providing anything, and we kind of shuffled that around with passive. If we want to be active about it, you put the doer in the first part in the subject position. Sunrise will work directly with you to create a marketing plan, budgeting plan, and a break-even analysis. It's a lot more engaging, a lot more uh, action-oriented, a lot more focused on what are you doing, who's doing it. That's some more examples here. I don't know if I'm going to read all these, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you get the idea. <laughs> Usually passive voice makes something boring and confusing, especially if you keep doing it back to back. Uh, it's better to use it minimally. Yeah, here we go. Uh, but there are cases where you do want to use passive voice, where active voice would be entirely inappropriate, uh, could even uh, cost you some business. So, like, what, what, what does that look like? Now, we here's some examples, I think, that are, are really good examples of what I'm talking about. So let's just kind of fixate on this a minute. Uh, so here's the less effective sentence. Since you did not meet the financial criteria, we have denied your application for a Sunrise franchise. Now, you could argue, well, that's clear, that's transparent. Uh, on the other hand, it kind of emphasizes the reader's failures. Since you did not meet the financial criteria. Now, that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> it's probably going to hurt somebody's feelings. They might even get emotionally hijacked uh, by phrasing it that way. And so we can be a little bit more sensitive by using the passive voice. Since financial criteria were not met, your application for a Sunrise franchise was not accepted at this time. So you kind of doubled up on the passive to put a little bit of distance between the idea that the person's responsible and that we're the ones deciding not to accept the, uh, you know, accept the application. Now, so you probably wouldn't want to say, <laughs> imagine if you applied uh, for school at St. Cloud State University and you got a letter back that said, you know, since your grades were low and your test scores were low, <laughs> uh, we, uh, St. Cloud State has denied your application. And that would really kind of, you'd kind of take that personally. I'd feel like a kick to the gut, right? Uh, whereas if it was, was I, don't, I don't think there's any way to make it sound great. I mean, you're not going to be happy uh, with it no matter what, uh, but at least it would soften the blow, you know, a little bit to say, you know, something like that. Uh, since GPA criteria were not met, uh, since, test, uh, since the testing standards were not uh, uh, adhered to, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, you get the idea. Uh, your application will not be accepted at this time. You know, they kind of snuck this uh, at this time in there as well to kind of say this is not a permanent uh, situation. It's a little bit more positive. Uh, so this is all, you know, you can easily imagine why you would prefer the passive voice in these situations. Let's see, they have some more examples here. Uh, you need to complete the application forms carefully for us to seriously consider your application. Yeah, this is getting into that idea of being bossy. You need to complete the application forms carefully for us to seriously consider your application. <laughs> yeah, probably not the tone, probably not the right tone. Uh, th this is much better here, uh, the second example. Application forms that are completed carefully allow us to better determine the merit of your application. You know, you don't need me to explain that. Clearly, the second one is it's not only more sensitive, I think it's it's just more, it's just more better. <laughs> you know, in all seriousness, though, uh, you know, really look at what we're talking about here. So we're moving from being this sort of aggressive, uh, bossy tone, to even demeaning. You need to complete the applications forms carefully. You know, it makes it sound like we're assuming they're not going to do that, uh, that they're being reckless. 
And so you move from that to this other example, application forms that are completed carefully allow us to better determine the merit of your application. And so when I hear these two, you know, I hear one that sounds uh, what I basically say rude and disrespectful. Uh, so we move from that to something a lot more sensitive, a lot more positive sounding. Uh, how do they word it, word it here? Yeah, they don't directly imply uh, that the reader is likely to make elementary mistakes. So really, it's, it's, it's about tone as, as much as it is about clarity. Uh, short, familiar words and phrases. Uh, whenever possible, choose short, conversational, and familiar words. Right. Why should you do that? Because longer, less common words uh, slows processing and can distract you from your message. You know, I'm always struggling with, especially in 191, you know, you, you've always got that student that's addicted to a thesaurus and is always wanting to impress you with their, you know, immense vocabulary. <laughs> you know, they're, they're a sesquipedalian, uh, meaning that they love long words. <laughs> so, uh, they think it's just so impressive to just keep uh, using what I call the, the $10 words. <laughs> uh, when really it doesn't make them look smarter. Uh, it just makes them look pompous. And so you really don't want to do this. I think the best advice, if you're not used to seeing the word in print, uh, then you don't want to be the one to be using it. Uh, you don't want to send, you don't want to send readers scurrying to the dictionary. Uh, you want to send them scurrying to their checkbook <laughs> or uh, I guess to PayPal. <laughs> and that's where you want them headed, uh, not to the dictionary uh, to look up some weirdo, weirdo word uh, that you pulled out of, you know, some thesaurus somewhere. Uh, so let's look at the example. Uh, Sunrise advocates that you seek consultation with us uh, during the application process. So they're uh, they're using advocates there instead of just saying suggests, and they're using uh, seek consultation instead of seeking our advice. And so just some quick examples, and I'm, I'm sure that you you know have seen plenty of documents like that. You know academics are just notorious uh, for this. They they really want to show off their vocabulary. Uh, they're, they're, I, I see it more as lacking confidence. You know, they're actually lacking in self-confidence because they're afraid you won't take them seriously as an academic unless they just, you know, pile on the multisyllabic <laughs> the terms. And I don't even know, especially if you're you're hearing this read aloud. It's one of my pet peeves. I I can't stand sitting at an academic conference. And somebody's just reading a paper. Uh, they don't even have a PowerPoint, but but that's a separate issue. And so they're reading this paper to you, and every other word is you know five syllables long. Uh, I can't follow it. You know, you look around, you see all these people just kind of smiling and nodding. You know, it's like it's kind of this big emperor's uh, new clothing <laughs> routine. <laughs> nobody gets it. Uh, nobody knows what the heck is being said there. Uh, it's totally inappropriate for the context of being read aloud. Uh, because it's really hard to process that. It'd be hard enough if you could read it, uh, but if you're just hearing it read aloud, uh, you have even less working memory uh, that you're dealing with there. So anyway, I'm kind of going on and on. <laughs> the point is, <laughs> you're not going to impress anybody uh, if every other word is juxtaposition. Uh, you'd be a lot more impressed. You, you will impress people if you have the right information, the good information, and you're communicating clearly and persuasively. Uh, anyway, I feel like I've been on a soapbox. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> uh, parallel language. Uh, what is that? Uh, well, it's just consistent grammatical patterns uh, across sentences or parallel or, uh, or paragraphs. And they say it's most important when you use a series or lists. Uh, so anything following a colon, for example, if it's a bulleted list, uh, anything like that, you want to keep it in the right. Uh, you want to keep it parallel. And I emphasize this again with resumes. You know, usually in a resume, you'll have a section there called uh, work or job experience, something like that. And you'll be listing out the different tasks and duties and awards you received at your various jobs. And I think it's really important to make sure those are all formatted you know, exactly the same way. So if it's if it's perform, if it's um, you know evaluated uh, 12 student projects, comma. Uh, the next thing we'll need to follow that same uh, pattern. So completed 12 credits. Uh, uh, what, what, what would be some other ones? Uh, <laughs> interned at seven uh, companies. You know, you get the ideas. Blah, 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 blah. 
Uh, sometimes it, that's when it helps to read aloud too, because sometimes you you can hear the parallel and what's not parallel, even if you can't see it just by looking at it. Sometimes if you read it aloud, you'll be able to catch that and say, well, that part's not parallel. That part's a little wonky. It's like you squeezed in a couple extra syllables there. Uh, maybe you can uh, fix that, make it more parallel. And really and truly, the beautiful authors... Uh, the people that end up in Bartlett's quotations, you know, all those great quotes and proverbs you remember uh, so well and, and live by, you know, almost all of those are parallel. There's countless examples um, of those. <laughs> just, just look, uh, go, uh, go to uh, quotes.com, uh, one of my favorite sites, or what is it, Bra Brainy Quotes. Uh, so go to the site Brainy Quotes. And look there and you'll see countless examples of very nice parallel sentences. And the reason they're great quotes is the reason you can remember them and they work is because they they're parallel. Uh, but anyway, let's look, let's, look, let's look at the examples <laughs> the author has provided here. <laughs> okay, so this is less effective. Something here will not be parallel. And so again, if you're, if you're watching this, just turn it off for a second and just listen or close your eyes and see if you can just hear what part's not parallel. Our customers are refined and purchase high-end products. So our customers are refined and purchase high-end products. Does it sound like there's a little bit of a piece there that just doesn't quite fit? Our customers are refined and purchase high-end products. Okay, so let's see if we can make it more parallel. Our customers are refined and upscale. Our customers are refined and upscale. Versus our customers are refined and purchase high-end products. Let's see if they have another example. Our customers appreciate refined craftsmanship and purchase high-end products. So if, if you look, if you just break this down, you can see we've got appreciate, refined craftsmanship. So verb, object, purchase is a verb, object, and the high-end and the refined are the adjectives there. And so refined craftsmanship, high-end products, appreciate, purchase, uh, you get the idea. And you can imagine if this, this, if this went on for like two or three more elements, it would be even more important to have that. Uh... All right, so there's a few more examples of this parallel language. Uh, so this would be less effective to say, uh, Sunrise will work directly with you to create a marketing plan, develop a budgeting plan, and break even analysis. Uh, so you can see there's a little something kind of missing there. It's like that uh, that house with the one corner is a little too high. You know, it just doesn't quite work. Uh, and then we could fix it a couple ways, right? You could say, Sunrise will work directly with you to create a marketing plan, budgeting plan, and break-even analysis. Basically, just cut out these uh, verbs. Uh, or we could add a verb. Uh, Sunrise will work directly with you to create a marketing plan, develop a budgeting plan, and set up a break-even analysis. Uh, so that's the basic idea. And I would encourage you, though, to, to follow this up some more. Uh, if you study rhetorical tropes, uh, there's many, many, many uh, technical terms for all kinds of different sorts of parallelism. Uh, and a lot of our best proverbs and, and quotations uh, follow this, follow one of these formula, uh, like JFK's famous uh, saying, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. You know, things of that sort, there's actually terms for that kind of uh, uh, structure. And so you can go far beyond just being parallel uh, with your stylistic stuff. And uh, I always think it's kind of fun to think about these, the, the parallel structures uh, here. Sometimes it's actually effective to break this because you're kind of playing, when you can play with the reader's expectations, you can shock them sometimes, get them to notice and sort of perk up uh, by shocking them. And I, I remember there's a preach, I heard a preacher one time that was fond of doing this. And I'll just uh, read you <laughs> sort of my own example of what he liked to do. <laughs> Uh, so this is an example of uh, intentionally breaking uh, parallel language for effect. Uh, so something like this. You need to read your Bible every day. Love your family every day. Help your endeavors every day. And every day is a gift from God. <laughs> As they see what, the, what they're doing there, right? Taking that, you kind of expect the same structure, but it's flipped around suddenly. And now it's uh, every day is what starts off uh, uh, the structure. So I don't know, maybe I'm just incredibly geeky and nerdy, but I, I love that kind of stuff. I, I love to see the, to me, it's almost poetic uh, to do that kind of a thing. Of course, you don't want to get carried away with it, but uh, it's always a pleasure to me to read a really uh, well-crafted sentence.
Uh, okay, avoiding buzzwords and the uh, figures of speech. Again, I kind of mentioned this before that sometimes this can get, you know, this is not a hard and fast rule with me. I think sometimes it's entirely appropriate uh, to use the buzzwords, but yeah, I can get a little bit uh, overused, I think is the key there, not never use, but I don't overuse it. Uh, what is a buzzword? Well, it's a workplace term that becomes trite because of overuse. I think they give examples like synergy, synergize, uh, proactive. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a million of them. It's, this is the kind of word that kind of makes you bristle a little bit. You're kind of like, oh, God, that, that, <laughs> that word again. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, I'm tired of hearing that. Uh, any word like that. I uh, should get on the radar. And I mean, it's not like academics. You know, academics get so pretentious sometimes. They think they're not using the buzzwords themselves. When, <laughs> my God. <laughs> they're probably some of the most guilty uh, of all uh, with the buzzwords, right? And, you know, you, you, what, what's some of the ones I keep hearing uh, around campus? Um, uh, well, I don't want to say it's a buzzword, uh, but mindful and mindfulness. You know, I hear a lot of people saying that these days. You know, we need to have a mindful practice. I'll give you a better example that came up in a com curriculum committee meeting the other day, and it was uh, best practices. <laughs> so somebody had proposed a curriculum, or uh, they were proposing a course, and they, one of the learning objectives there was something about best practices of blah, blah, blah. Best practices in, in uh, I don't know, diplomatic messaging, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, he was saying this, this particular uh, committee member was saying that word best practices it's, it's been overused and what does it even mean it's just kind of a little trite word people throw in there <laughs> to sound kind of uh, to kind of create a little buzz right uh, it really doesn't mean anything can we can we find a more specific term and so that's just a quick real life example of a, a buzzword so he wanted to change it to something uh, that didn't buzz so much but you know maybe that's the, maybe that's the best way to think about this like a little it's kind of like a mosquito. It's like bzzz, right in your, bzzz, you know, very annoying. Uh, you don't want to do it. You're just going to annoy everybody, uh, especially if you get carried away with it. Yeah, stir negative feelings among some readers. So this guy kind of lost his cool when he saw that best practices. I mean, he just, I wouldn't say he got emotionally hijacked, but yeah, you could definitely tell he's just kind of rolling his eyes. He's like, oh. <laughs> it's just like a little mosquito right over there in his ear. I didn't like it. Uh, figures of speech, um, yeah, contain non-literal meanings, uh, little aphorisms, uh, some proverbs generally out of place, uh, inappropriate or inappropriate in business writing. So anything you'd have to specify in front of it. Well, this is just that was just a figure of speech, right? <laughs> I don't really want to kill you. I would just, uh, I don't really want to slay my audience. Uh, that's just a figure of speech. Uh, well, uh, again, maybe uh, the, you might be talking to a group that would not realize that was just a figure of speech. Maybe that figure of speech doesn't exist in their language and it sounds like you're threatening them. <laughs> Probably not the reaction you were going for. Uh, let's look at some of their examples. Oh, the most, oh wow, the most annoying buzzwords. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I wonder how they compiled this list. Uh, dozens of such lists exist. Okay, okay. so apparently this is based on a, sur a recent survey of executives. And so that's interesting because they're probably the ones that are using these. Let's see, leverage. Yeah, you need to get some leverage. Uh, we need to have some reach out happening here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's this this annoying. It is what it is. <laughs> oh man, I love to use that. It does seem to annoy my wife though. Uh, viral. Yeah, we need a we need this to go viral. Uh, this is a real game changer. <laughs> we got disconnect. <laughs> Are you disconnected? <laughs> you probably maybe you disconnected. You got so annoyed with these buzzwords. Huh? Uh, circle back, value add, cutting edge. You know, one that's just about to drive me crazy, folks, is the one I keep hearing over, I mean, over, and it really is like a bzzz in my ear, is uh, we need to close the loop. We need to close the loop. And now every time somebody says that, they get this certain look on their face, like this sort of <laughs> big smile, like they, <laughs> and like they just feel so, it's like they just took a big shot of vodka. They're like, well, we know we need to close the loop. 
And I'm like, man, what does that even mean, close the loop? Uh, why do you keep saying that? Just really annoying. What do you, <laughs> what do you actually mean? <laughs> and here's the one that I have a dear friend uh, who loves this word synergy. And, you know, anytime the guy talks, anytime he gives a speech of any sort, I play a little game with myself and, and I'm like, how long is it going to be until he uses the word synergy? <laughs> and then how many times will he use it? And he never disappoints, never disappoints, always has the, for some reason, uh, to use the word synergy. This is one of his favorite words. Now you can look at that and say, well, it's annoying. Uh, or I think you could look at it as a, a salesperson would, uh, somebody who's a little bit savvy with rhetoric. Uh, would, would be picking up on these terms and say, well, this person just used the word customer centric or close the loop. And, you know, they, had that, they got that look on their face when they said it, like they just took the shot of vodka. So I probably should, I might be able to uh, use that, I might be able to leverage that <laughs> uh, to my own, to my own uh, advantage uh, by using it myself uh, strategically. And that might show the person, yeah, we're on the same page. We've got great synergy. You know, we're just synergizing together. We're <laughs> using the same word. <laughs> so I don't, basically what I'm saying, I don't necessarily think it's always annoying. Uh, it could actually be the opposite. It could be a way to connect. Let's see, avoiding it is and, and there are. Yeah, these, again, another one of these rules where sometimes you need to use it just so your sentence will be parallel or just so you won't have uh, too many short, choppy sentences back to back, because you know, that's another part of this. You don't want to sound choppy. But again, yeah, if you're just, if every sentence is, it is this, and there are this, and there is, it just makes it needlessly wordy. You can usually uh, trim some of this. Uh, so let's look at some ex examples of this. There are many reasons for owning a Sunrise store. You could just say, owning a Sunrise store has many benefits. It is wonderful to see happy customers day in and day out. You could just say, seeing happy customers day in and day out is wonderful. So if you, if you, look, if you look at the style guides, uh, they'll talk about this again, neuro-linguistically, you know, really get into somebody's head as they're reading this. So when you're reading this example, it is wonderful to see happy customers. I mean, you really have to wait till you get to happy customers uh, before you get any kind of image in your mind. If I just say it is, those are just words. There's nothing there mentally. There's nothing to picture there. It's just kind of dead. On the radio, this would just be dead. Why do they call that the, uh, the silence? <laughs> dead, dead zone? Or, uh, I'm blanking on the name. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, though. Dead air? I think it's called dead air. <laughs> anyway, it's just kind of mental dead air. It is. Whereas if I say seeing happy customers, you really get to see that image a lot faster. Uh, same thing here. It is great to be in a line of business where there are such extremely loyal customers. Uh, so we could change that to just in this line of business, customers are extremely loyal. And so it's not exactly beautiful sentences, but at least we get to something we can see customers um, earlier than we can that other example. All right, so let's uh, wrap up here with some uh, thoughts on the navigational design. And again, this is something I think is really important for a class like this because you don't get it uh, in most other English classes. They're not concerned. They might even say don't use headings, uh, don't use bulleted lists. Uh, you know, they might say specifically don't do this stuff. <laughs> so uh, this is what happens in a business scenario where the new, the new person comes in, the new employee, and even though uh, you know, he or she has made A pluses in all their English classes. They are an English major. Uh, nevertheless, this uh, executive, this manager is saying, the person can't write. Or the person is writing terribly. You know, they actually became a worse writer. Well, no, no, no. It's just a different, it's just a di massively different purpose and style is, is the problem. Uh, the problem is in a business scenario, you want to have a, a, a totally different navigational design because uh, again, the point is not to immerse somebody in, in deep thought and have them struggling with, uh, <laughs> you know, weighty intellectual topics. No, no, no. The point is to be keep it simple, uh, to get to the information, and to make this thing to make it easy. You probably don't, you shouldn't expect somebody to start at the beginning, work their way all all the way to the end. It doesn't work like that. You know, they're flipping through this thing, trying to get to the section they need, and the quicker they can do that. You know, that's considered good writing in, in that context. It's not, you know, how uh, beautifully crafted I, I can and how many multisyllables <laughs> it can squeeze in. <laughs> so, uh, headings. 
And so yeah, an information rich, complex messages, headings can help your readers identify those areas and navigate the document to the areas of interest. So a handy example here, resumes. You know, some people they say, well, I, they don't. They, for some reason, they don't want to put these headings in there. I said, that's just crazy. You know, obviously, you should have a heading, uh, little headings and subheadings like uh, education, uh, job experience, right, uh, re or certifications. You know, whatever it is, it's going to be a lot easier for the person to find that information if you put it on there in a nice heading. Um, you know, I've seen these resumes that are kind of crazy. Everything's all cluttered around. It's like one big page, and there's they basically every little bit of space has some words in there. <laughs> just, just makes it chaotic. Uh, you can't find what you're looking for. And I don't want to have to look all around the stupid resume uh, to see what your GPA was or to, or to see if you had the right kind of degree. And it's the same. That that same concept is true for any kind of business document. Uh, so let's think about ways we could highlight stuff. You know, they taught you could literally highlight it with the, you know, most modern software like like this uh, PowerPoint. I could just literally highlight something. <laughs> that's a way to highlight, uh, but maybe that's not an option. Uh, so you could try the bold, the italics, and my least favorite, the underlining. I just just kind of bugs me. <laughs> uh, but those can draw attention, keep the reader's attention. I will say there's like we were talking about before though. Sometimes, especially the bold can come across as being bossy or imperious. <laughs> there's your, there's your multisyllabic word. <laughs> and uh, condescending, uh, if you got big bold everywhere. You know, imagine if I had an assignment for you and I, everything was in bold and, and underlined, like, <laughs> this document must be two pages long, and I had that, like, underlined and in bold. Uh, you'd probably be insulted by that. I'm like, wow, this is, you know, come on. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> no shot at me. <laughs> You know, much less all caps. And so keep that in mind, especially if this is only going to a manager. You probably want to avoid the italics on things in bold. You know, give the person a little credit. Give the person a little respect. Uh, yeah, and again, if you use too much of the formatting, your main ideas will not stand out. And they've actually shown this in learning research, uh, where students who highlight stuff in their books actually retain less. You know, let me say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Students who highlight their books perform worse. Yes, you heard that correctly. So if you got a highlighter, ditch it, just get rid of it, throw it away, <laughs> banish it, because <laughs> it's actually doing you more harm than good. Uh, and there's the science behind that. So it's something to certainly keep in mind. And I always say, too, the best way to make something stand out is just to cut out the stuff around it. Uh, so if it's really, if I really want to draw your attention to the fact this thing needs to be two pages long, uh, then yeah, I could bold, italicize, underline, highlight, and have a big old barrel flashing at it, you know, all that. Uh, or I could just take out all the unnecessary stuff around it, and you would uh, uh, just look right at it. I don't even need all that. I kind of think about it too. I heard a comedian. It's not that funny of a joke, so don't get too excited, but. <laughs> uh, there was a, a point in time where everybody was putting these little balls on their uh, car antennas, <laughs> the radio antenna. <laughs> that shows you how old the joke is. <laughs> it's like a little uh, Phillips 57 or 56. They had these little balls. And the idea was you put this little ball on your radio antenna. And then if you forgot where you parked and you went out into the parking lot, you could look around the lot and you could see the little ball and realize that was your car. And the comedian's joke was, you know, everybody should have one of these balls. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> and of course, you know, uh, that wouldn't work. Uh, it would be useless at that point. So I, I told you it wasn't that funny of a joke, but uh, it kind of tickles me. <laughs> Somebody teaching you <laughs> uh, not to be uh, not to use these uh, tools too much. Sometimes, again, less is more. All right, let's look at some uh, less humorous examples. Um, uh, Sunrise will work directly with you to create a marketing plan, budgeting plan, and break-even analysis. Now, as you can hear, that was all in italics. <laughs> okay, that was totally useless, me reading that to you. I apologize for that. Uh, the whole thing was in italics. So... Really what it's saying is you italicized everything, so nothing was actually highlighted there. You know, it's exactly like the student who highlights uh, their entire book. It's basically the stuff that's not highlighted might stand out at that point, which is probably not what they were going for. 
Now, so more effective, okay, just to, high, uh, just to italicize part of it. So they just italicize, Sunrise will work directly with you instead of having the whole line italicized there. <clears throat> uh, Sunrise will provide free training. So now they've got, uh, the bold wasn't good enough. You know, they had to, to underline it too. Uh, it's just, come on. <laughs> uh, just the bolding is fine. You know, I like to do this when I'm writing an assignment. If I do, for whatever reason, uh, have it all in a paragraph, if there's one part of that that's just really important, uh, I will put that part in bold uh, just so the eye can be drawn to that. And one of the examples is not listed here, uh, just something that, again, happened to me one time, is that uh, if you have numbers, if you have a paragraph of words and there's a number, like four, like four o'clock, uh, that's what the eye will jump to. Uh, you'll be easy, it's easy to see the number in, the, in a big block of text. Well, the problem that happened to me was it was a final exam, no less. And they had sent out an announcement, you know, giving the what the final was going to cover and uh, where it was going to be and when it was going to be, and all this stuff. And I looked at it and I was, you know, scanning it. I'd read it before, uh, but I was scanning it to see when the final was, and it, it said two o'clock. That's what I saw on the, uh, you know, that's what I looked at. It was written out two o'clock, you know, two colon zero zero. <laughs> so I show up at two o'clock and there's like four people there and they look like they're finishing their final. I mean, they're like getting up with their blue books and, and turning the things in. I'm like, what the? Like, look, checking my watch. I'm like, this is a joke. Is it, am I at the Twilight Zone? I mean, what the heck is going on? And I, you know, I go over there and the professor's looking at me like, you know, uh, you know that look. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? I, it's two o'clock, isn't it? Uh, He's like, yes, it's two o'clock. The final is over now. I'm like, oh my God, I, you know, it says two o'clock on the on the instructions, you know, the announcements. He's like, no, it doesn't. And I'm like, yeah, I just I just looked at it, you know. So we, you know, we bring up the instructions, and, and what what had happened uh, was that it said uh, it said down in here it was noon. So they had written out the word noon, n o o n. The, the final exam will be from noon, the word, to 2 o'clock. And the 2 o'clock was written out as a number. And so that's just a kind of a lengthy example, but you get the idea. Uh, since that 2 o'clock uh, was written out as numbers, it stood out from everything else. That's what was emphasized. Uh, that What they should have done is either wrote out noon and then wrote 2 o'clock out as words, or just did the 12 you know, 12 and make sure it was all numeric. Or they could have bolded it, <laughs> uh, but you get the point, hopefully. And one of my more terrifying moments as a student. <laughs> you know, the good news is I was able to uh, take the final anyway. Uh, maybe you can use that as the, the excuse if you're ever in that situation. <clears throat> yeah, this is a big old thing. I'm not going to even read this. It's just a big clutter, big honking paragraph there. Uh, we need to break that thing up with some bullets. And so that's what we've done here. So they took that one big paragraph, they made it a shorter paragraph with some nice bullets. Now I will go ahead and say this. A bullet point, it's very stupid to have a bullet point followed by a paragraph. That just bugs me. Um, I think it's kind of pointless to, to do that. If you're going to have a paragraph, just format it as a separate paragraph. Put a subheading on it, whatever. Uh, bullets only work for short things. If it's like a sentence or two or a phrase or a word, it's great. Uh, not good uh, for more than a couple of sentences. So I'm just putting that putting that out there. Uh, this is fine. You notice it's not going on. You know, if these were like three or four sentences long, I'd have a problem with it. But it's not. It's just short. You know, works great. Doesn't waste uh, too much space. Sometimes you have to go to two columns or even three or four columns if you've got lots of bulleted lists, though, because otherwise you'll waste a lot of uh, space that way. Okay, to review uh, the message, uh, we'll talk about this conducting the, the FAIR test, proofreading, and then uh, getting the feedback. So as you'll probably recall, <laughs> I kind of doubt it, but <laughs> maybe you'll recall what FAIR st stands for. Uh, first is the facts. So are we confident in the facts? Are we clear about our assumptions? Uh, have you avoided slanting the facts, or making other logical errors? 
uh, access. Have we granted enough access to message recipients about decision making information? You know, have they had enough time to look at it and review it, given a chance to provide input on it? Are your motives clear? Uh, the impacts. Uh, how will the message impact various stakeholders? Right? Is it, is it likely to lead to an emotional hijacking? You know, if it's something like that, you want to be, you know, double sensitive. Uh, have you evaluated impacts on others? Ethical, corporate, uh, different perspectives. Uh, respect. So my number one. Uh, have you demonstrated respect for the inherent worth of others? Their aspirations, thoughts, feelings, well-beings. Have you shown that you value others? You know, as again, as a teacher, it really bothers me when I hear other teachers talk about students as being ignorant or, or they talk about, you know, we the standards have gotten so low here at St. Cloud State, we'll just take any old idiot. And yeah, I hear that. I really just grates on my nerves. I'm like, man, you know, I, I don't even think this person should be a teacher. Uh, they really do not have the respect uh, for the, you know, I don't care who you are. Uh, you know, if you're in my classroom, I respect you. Uh, you have inherent worth. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of goes without saying uh, for me, but, you know, uh, I'm not trying to make myself sound like some kind of a, a saint <laughs> or an angel on that. <laughs> I just think it's really important to, to show respect. You know, I can't expect you to respect me if I don't respect you. It's kind of the way I look at it. <clears throat> All right, so some chapter takeaways here. Uh, hopefully we've you can take some stuff <laughs> away from this. So just to recap, we talked about the writing style needs to be complete. Do you have all the information you need there? Uh, have you been concise? Have you are you being wordy? Have you got lots of redundancy? Can we trim trim a bit, get it down? Have we thought about that natural processing stuff happening in the brain even? You know, so that's why we don't want to, we don't want the endless sentences like John Cleese. <laughs> just so much stuff tacked on, we can't even process it. Uh, think about the brain. Now, have you, have the, are you giving the people the, have you thought about their brain <laughs> and their working memory? Um, navigational design. Uh, so are you just writing these big blurb, big blobs, paragraphs? Or have you actually put some thought into headings and lists and uh, maybe even whether it should be in multiple columns? Uh, you know, all that stuff. It may, sometimes a document, you even need to have a table of contents, an index, you know, uh, tables that <laughs> can help. <laughs> I like the way these, uh, if you think about the design of this PowerPoint, you notice how it started off with the uh, learning objectives and they had the chapter organization. Now here we're chapter takeaways. So he's put some thought into the design of the PowerPoint even. And you want to be doing the same no matter what kind of document it is. And then finally that reviewing stage, really critical. And again, you want to be planning like that much drafting, like that much <laughs> and reviewing, like again, about as much planning and reviewing. Uh, so note that the actual creation, the drafting process is the shortest phase. You know, most of your time should be spent uh, at the uh, planning and reviewing stage. Uh, anyway, I uh, covered a lot of material here. Hopefully you found this interesting. Uh, if you have uh, questions, comments, love to hear those. Also, if you have stories, love to hear those. I'm uh, hopefully be able to collect some of those the so next time uh, I'll have more fun stories <laughs> to sprinkle in <laughs> uh, to my PowerPoints. I've already read some uh, really great ones, so you know, maybe I'll share those at some point. Uh, but anyway, uh, do let me know those thoughts. I hope you enjoy this, and I'll see you next time.